Hello, welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason. That's where we are. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you from our EW10 studios in the heart of Irondale, Alabama. This is the mothership. This is where it all began with Mother Angelica, reminding you that this show is all about your questions. Email us questions at spitzersuniverse at EW10.com. Post your questions on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash EW10 online hashtag FS for Father Spitzer and its universe, FS Universe. Send us a tweet at twitter.com forward slash EW10 hashtag FS Universe as well. And don't forget a great resource for this program is the Magis Center's website, magiscenter.com. That's uh, where Father Spitzer's got all of his wonderful materials available to you. And speaking about wonderful materials, we've got Mother Angelica's book, Answers Not Promises. It's flying off the shelves here at our religious catalog, EW10RC.com. This is an all new edition. Uh, it's a soft cover edition featuring a new forward by Father Joseph Mary Wolf, our own uh, EW10 chaplain, the first of our priests uh, in the group started by Mother Angelica himself, new mother probably better than anybody here. Uh, straightforward solutions to life's puzzling problems. Check it out, EW10RC.com, answers not promises. Speaking of answers, and we're promising that they will be good answers, we welcome Father Spitzer from our West Coast studios in Orange County, California. Welcome, Father. Great to see you again. Great to be back with you, Doug. Okay. We, we're, you know, we, we spent so much time talking about the evidence of God's existence. If there is a God, why should he permit suffering? That's really what we were talking about. And we got so many questions right. and there's so much to cover that we decided let's do another show on this one. So we want to start off with that. And first I want to start off with uh, a couple of comments people made to us on Twitter uh, that I wanted you to maybe react to. The first one is, this person's sure. perspective was suffering brings us closer to Christ. He wants us to come together to support and love each other as brothers and sisters. That's what Susie's point was. And then Otso said, right. God allows it for it because it, it's a means by which we humans come to realize our limitations. What do you think of those couple of perspectives? Well, I think those are profoundly um, important and very good perspectives on suffering. I mean, the main thing we want to remember is that God's perspective on suffering is eternal. So he is drawing us to eternal life. That's our real destiny. He's drawing us to our real destiny, our transcendental destiny, which is toward himself, who is perfect love, perfect truth, perfect goodness, perfect beauty, and perfect home. So his objective is to have us freely choose that remarkable, wonderful, eternal destiny with him. Now, I know that sounds like, uh, well, that's a no-brainer. I mean, anyone uh, would, uh, would certainly want to choose eternal truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home with God. I mean, wh what fool would not want to do that? Until we start getting into the, the complexity of the world in which we're living. Because, of course, what love means is that we're going to have to sacrifice some egocentricity. What love and goodness means is that we just can't dominate people in any way that we, what goodness means is that we're going to have to abide by principles of goodness that are going to guarantee that injustice is not done in the world. We're going to have to have principles. We're going to have to have discipline. We can't be egocentric. We can't dominate people. And in the end result, of course, we can't be self-idolatrous. We cannot be, uh, you know, worshiping ourselves instead of worshiping the true God. So what happens is, of course, we've got all these choices before us. And, and as life presents all these choices, uh, we not only have our own personal weakness to deal with after the fall, after original sin, but we also have this little devil out there that is uh, no question very busy about trying to seduce us into a life that looks happy, it, it looks like it's loving, it looks looks like it's beautiful, but in the end result, 
It is not beautiful. In fact, it's very dark. It's very empty. It's very ego gratifying. It's very self idolatrous. It's very dominating, very elusive, very selfish. But of course, it looks good because the devil is such a great tempter. Mm -hmm. He knows how to remember those baptismal promises. Do you reject Satan? Yeah, I do. And all his works I do. And all his empty promises. There's the deal. And so, of course, what God has to help us through is to move through the shadowy world of empty promises, the shadowy world of darkness and emptiness that looks beautiful and happy, but in the end result is very selfish, very uh, dominating, very idolatrous, right? Self idolatrous, etc. And, and one of his tools, one of the best tools that's out there is actually suffering. Yes, the truth of God that comes to us through the scriptures in Jesus Christ, that's an important tool. The sacraments, that's an important tool. The unconditional love of God come to us in Christ Jesus in history, that's indispensably important and more than any tool. But of course, suffering, suffering provides a real incentive. Suffering shocks us right out of superficiality sometimes. Suffering is what finally gets us to ask the important questions about life. You know, what really makes life worth living? It's suffering at, at the end of the day that compels us to a kind of humility that St. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, right? The thorn in the flesh, right? The angel of Satan to beat him, to keep him from getting proud toward, toward humility. It is suffering that compels us toward compassion, suffering that brings the best out of us, the self-sacrifice for the purpose of the noble, the self-sacrifice for the purpose of compassion, the self-sacrifice to stop evil in the world, even at great cost that we can put ourselves on the line. It brings the best out of us. Right. And of course, at the end of the day, right, you know, suffering has so many benefits uh, for all of these purposes, but at the end of the day, it leads us ultimately to salvation, which is what God wants for us, this eternal life of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, which is perfect joy with Him. And right. that's where He's leading us and suffering is indispensable. So those those listeners, they, they, they really have a, right. a very good and mature perspective on it. Well, I think you're hitting the mark there, so that's good. We're getting people to, th to think and also to offer their own perspectives on this, which is what this program's all designed to be about. Here's a, a question for you, Father right. Spitzer. Uh, when should we begin talking to our kids about why God permits suffering? And if so, how should we do this? This is from Kathy. Yeah, I, I do think that um, I shouldn't say this so cavalierly, but how about five years old? You know, now I went into kindergarten when I was five years old, and I must admit, you know, there were kinds of suffering and things of that nature, you know, that, that happened to me beforehand. You know, I'd stick my hand through a window or something or, you know, uh, you know do some crazy things. But I, I didn't have this, you know, this sense that, you know, God wasn't in my camp. I thought, well, that was dumb sticking my hand through the window. But the, 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 then you start going to school. And when you start going to school, a different kind of suffering begins to occur. It's kind of a reflective suffering. So you might experience the rejection of a friend at school. That's a deeper kind of thing which does cause a child to ask why. Not necessarily why about God, but why about the suffering. And then, of course, other kinds of things happen that are generally on the par with fairness or injustice or injustice. Something happens where a kid suddenly begins to say, life is not fair. And it's that question. It's not so much, I did something dumb, I slipped, and I skinned my knee. That doesn't cause the reflection. But when they start thinking, hey, this isn't fair, that person's not fair, that person's cruel, then the question starts coming out, why? 
why? And once that question starts coming out, it's why did God let this happen to me? Sometimes kids who are adopted, they need to be told a little earlier because if you tell them they're adopted, sometimes there's the feeling of rejection, mm -hmm. then the why, then the why did God allow this and so forth. The main thing, first of all, is I would say early in life is not too bad. Mm -hmm. So if you do it a little earlier in life, that's going to be just perfect. But the main thing to re remember is that when you're talking about it, you have to keep putting it in, in, the, in a twofold context. The first thing is that God's whole perspective for you is to bring you to salvation. That's the most important thing. Everything else is secondary. It may not feel like it's secondary when you're suffering, but it is secondary compared to your salvation. And you, you have to learn this discipline of how can this help me get to heaven? How can this lead me ever closer to God and other people and therefore closer to heaven? The second thing to, to point out is Jesus suffered with us. And Jesus gave us many lessons on how to suffer. Why? Because suffering is going to be inevitable. People are going to be cruel. And when people are cruel, that's not God's fault. And of course, we have to teach our children, right, not to blame God for what's not God's fault. In other words, if somebody makes fun of me on the playground, right, or, or, or says something which is a terribly cruel thing to say, right, the, the main purpose is that, you know, the main thing to say is, look, that's, that's not God's uh, fault. You can ask God for help mm -hmm. and he will help you. You can ask God to let this be water off a duck's back and the water will roll off you, the, you know, the insult can roll off you like a duck's back. Now, it takes time and it takes discipline. Sticks and stones can break my bones, my mother would say to me, but names can never hurt <laughs> right, me, right, you know. Right. And of course, yep. it, but these things, these platitudes are important. And of course, we don't want to blame God for what other kids do. And we have to teach people right. early on, our kids early on, can't hide it, that people can be dark and cruel and empty, and they're not representing God. But right. God can help us through it, right. and we don't want to blame God for it. Right. But the main thing is, yes, this happens, right. and you know we have to just uh, deal with it in a right. disciplined way, right. but also you know, with the help of God. And I would think it's also important then also the, for the parents and the adults to show how they react to suffering in their lives and other losses so that uh, they don't see the parents uh, blaming God for this, uh, you know, that they understand that from, from them acting it out and, and, and modeling the, the right response. I was wondering, you started Absolutely. Uh, kindergarten, kindergarten and fifth grade, so so uh, I'm when you were five years old. So you graduate high school when you were seven, yeah. or what? What exactly? How did that work? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I graduated high school. Or the rest of, you know, as they say, the old eighteen-year-old okay, graduate. Okay, so, but, you, uh, I so went you were to holding back. School and yeah, I was holding. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, I did. Uh, as they say, I, I, you know, I learned uh, a tremendous amount in high school. It was a great right. experience. And in college, I audited every class I could take. You yeah. Know, okay. I, you know, I, I was interested in philosophy. I was interested in history. I was interested in, uh, definitely in, later in theology in my junior and senior year. And of course, you know, being a, a guy who was, uh, you know, majoring basically in math and, and accounting and, you know, uh, uh, you know, people were going, uh, why, why are you taking the philosophy class? Because I, I want to take the philosophy right. class, you know. Uh, well, why are you taking that history class? Because I really want to take that it's history class. But right. yeah, we, yeah. we got free audits. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so well, I had there a is great a, time. <laughs> there is a joy in learning for learning unto itself. You know? Oh, yeah. And that's oh, yeah. an important thing for, for sometimes in the, in the world we live in today, which tends to be overly practical, that it's kind of the idea, well, though, yeah. if I don't get something out of it, why am I bothering? You know, they needs, and it needs to be an immediate, exactly. re, kind of an immediate return. You know, I was looking at a quote that Mother Teresa, yeah. of course, we've got uh, Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta is going to be canonized in September, and people can look for that. All that coverage uh, coming yeah. up on EWTN in, in early September. Go to EWTN.com, find out all the information. We'll have a website up as well. But she said, pain and suffering right. have come into your life, but remember, pain, sorrow, suffering are but the kiss of Jesus a sign that you have come cl so close to him that he can kiss you. What do you think about that? 
Well, I, I certainly think it's the case, and I'll speak for myself, uh, in, in, you know, principally. I mean, the times when I have made the most progress in my life, in terms of my self-definition, right, the times I've really made, uh, you know, progress in, in, in terms of, you know, getting out of superficiality, and especially with respect to humility, which is so vital in life and so vital for love, because, you know, if you're not humble, self-sacrifice is pretty much impossible, you know, yet self-sacrifice is the most noble thing in which we can be involved. So the, the, the main thing for me, you know, is that, uh, you know, suffering has been a kiss of Jesus. The main thing you have to remember, though, is when the suffering is, is, is taking place, that is not to go into the I'm going to go into myself and, and start getting fearful and anxious and, and so forth. As my eyes began to go bad when I was in, in, in Rome, I, I was, you know, 31 years old. And, you know, all of a sudden I, I'm having trouble just reading the Hebrew pointing. You know, then I go back to the United States, get the eye exam. And he says, you're going to lose your driver's license. Ah! You know, I mean, you know, for me, losing my driver's license is just like freedom. my autonomy right, and, right. and my freedom. And, yeah, and, right. and so then of course, I, you know, I begin to say, well, how long do I have, you know, how many books do I have to read before, you know, the inevitable happens to me? And they say, oh, no, you, you know, you can, you'll still be able to read for another 20 years, Whew, you know, but, I, but the, the, free, the fear and the anxiety, they, they, they're going to come up very naturally. There are ways, though, of dealing with the fear of anxiety and, and anxiety, and, and I've got my little prayer, which I keep talking about, um, you know, there are two of them, actually, I love Loving will be done, which is the one I say to the Father. And Lord Jesus, I place my trust in you, is the one I say to the Lord Jesus. So, I mean, both of those, you know, prayers, you know, I just say them, you know, especially when this, these things were new to me and I was very fearful because I had been able to drive, I'd been able to do these things before, and I, I got fearful. What am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? And you just have to put yourself in the hands of the Lord. And look at what happens, right? I find people who are all willing to help me, right? Suddenly they come out of the woodwork. And when I got ordained, you know, and I actually, I lost my driver's license, uh, you know, at, just right before my ordination, you know, and, uh, and um, you know, this, of course, you know, I, I literally went into my provincial, uh, my provincial's office. I don't know if I told this story mm -hmm. before, and uh, and uh, my provincial said, so, so what's the matter? And I said, well, you know, I, I really got to be honest with you. You know, uh, my eyes are really going bad, and maybe I'll only have 20, 30 years, you know, and maybe it's lights out after that, you know, and uh, this retinitis pigmentosa stuff. And and so he says, well, well, what are you thinking? I'm, I said, well, if you want me to to kind of resign now before the ordination. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to be a burden to the, the whole society. I said, you know, just just let me go if, if you think my, my worth has been seriously compromised. And he looked at me and he goes, what spirit have you been listening to? <laughs> just like that. Oh and of course, Good point. Uh, you know, uh, it woke me up. You know, this is not the way God works. What God wants to do mm -hmm. is help you know, take care. So, you know, I, right. I had to ask for rides to go to my, I was, you know, I taught at, uh, you know, a variety of different places. But when I was, uh, you know, teaching at, at Georgetown, I would literally have mm. to ask if I wasn't going to preach at Holy Trinity Church, I'd have to ask for a ride to go to that church. But it, there were 100 people who volunteered to give right. me a ride. That's right. And, you know, I mean, uh, I, I never really had to worry. I could always figure out mass transit. You know, you know, I, I always had enough to, to, to do the reading I needed to do. You know, it just things just kind of fell into place. And I really did start trusting in the Lord. And it made a huge difference that trust because you know Jesus says it to the father you know whose daughter has just died right fear is useless what is needed is trust mm -hmm. and that is in fact the case when suffering comes fear is and anxiety are per, they're the most debilitating things but if we can give it over to Jesus and then start looking for the opportunities of suffering 
it'll make a huge difference. I made an offer to the uh, listeners, um, you know, um, uh, of the program mm -hmm. last week. If you want chapter seven of my new book, I just got the galleys uh, oh, great. finished. Okay. It's going to come out in a couple of months. Um, but if you want chapter seven on looking for the opportunities in suffering, uh, I, I can send that chapter to people just to give them a little starting point of mm -hmm. well, what, where to look and what kinds of opportunities and, and how to orient your life when something unexpected happens and you think, you know, for a second the darkness come and the world is ending. Mm -hmm. Gee, there's so many opportunities on the level of changing your life's path or, you know, getting out right. of a superficial definition or getting to deeper faith, much deeper faith, much deeper prayer, humility, so, so uh, Father, you know, service, compassion. How would, how would how would somebody get that? How would they, would, should they go to the Magis Center website? Or oh, they, yeah, if just, they wanted yeah, to get just, that? Uh, uh, yeah, just go to Spitzer at MagisCenter.com. Okay, very good. And, and people can get uh, that. Yeah, Spitzer, S-P-I-T-Z-E-R okay. at Magis Center, yeah, M-A-G-I-S I, I Center. We, I, I think we got com. your name down by now, I, hopefully on the show. But at this point <laughs> in time, we, we've accomplished that far that we, we understand what your last name is. <laughs> right. And as we go to a break, I want to say Mother Angelica had a quote that sometimes my worst day, one filled with pain and suffering, in the eyes of God is my best day if I've borne it cheerfully and I've borne it with love. So just to fit into what you're saying. Much more ahead as we leave Father Spitzer momentarily to take our much needed break here, but don't leave us. We're right in the middle of Father Spitzer's universe talking about why does God allow suffering? Much more ahead. back to Father Spitzer's Universe. I'm Doug Keck talking about the evidence of God's existence. If there is a God, why does he allow suffering? This is kind of part two. We have so many questions, so let's move quickly to get them all in. Father Spitzer, here's a bit of a follow-up to what you just said and, and the question we had about children earlier. This person writes, why does God allow children to die from disease when people pray and pray for healing for their child and it doesn't happen? How can they trust God again? And this is Elaine. Trust, losing you know, a child, well, probably nothing well, more you know, tragic for a family. Oh, yeah, right. absolutely true. I mean, uh, nothing could be more tragic uh, than the death of a child. And, and it, it, it absolutely rips uh, the, the guts out of uh, parents. There's, there's no question about it. There is a, a hole that's left in, 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 in their being uh, for the rest of their lives. But faith is, is vital, and, and, and there are many reasons why God might allow a, a child uh, to die early. And, and we can't begin to, to understand what those reasons might be. The one thing we do have to do, because of our lack of understanding, is, is we do have to trust that he's going to take that child to himself. And, you know, I mean, Jesus already has said this, right? You know, their, their angels look into my heavenly Father's eyes. So, I mean, you know, children are so close to God. And, and we, you know, if you just look at those studies of near-death experiences, you know, 85% of children have, a, a, you know, who undergo clinical death, not only have a near-death experience, but a very positive near-death experience, uh, connecting uh, w with Jesus almost right away. And so the, the, the idea then that, that uh, you know, the ch this child didn't experience, I, I mean, that, that child is going to God, going to glory. And of course, that child will, in some sense, uh, be with the parents, uh, you know, in, in a sense, spiritually, uh, until they join uh, him or her in, in the kingdom of, of heaven. Now, that's the first thing, is if we don't have faith in that, I mean, then the, the death of the child is, is going to become very, very tragic indeed. So uh, the, the, our first, uh, you, know, uh, ob, you know, obligation, it's like a discipline, is when that pain and that loneliness and that emptiness ensue and, and just a desire to almost rage out, uh, you know, against the unfairness uh, of this. 
is to remember that that child is with God in joy and in glory and in love. That the second thing that has to be remembered is, you know, God is not, you, you don't want to picture God as, as, as sort of in the Old Testament sense of uh, interacting with nature at all times, right? That he's, he can interact with nature at all times. And God does perform lots of miracles, but God also allows natural causation uh, to, to, to take its course. And sometimes natural causation affects children. Sometimes some children get miracles and sometimes other children do not get miracles, which causes the parents of the child who doesn't get the miracle to ask, why me instead of them? And I don't know if you remember, uh, you know, there was um, a child, Heaven is for Real was uh, the name of, of this movie with this kid, Damien. And, and, you know, he has this near-death experience, comes back and talks about it. But, you know, the other mother uh, who, you know, is, is featured in the story who, whose child died didn't come back, you know, um, and, and didn't relate this, this near-death experience. But, you know, uh, and of course the resentment that she mm -hmm. felt, uh, you know, about this was, was tremendous. But again, there's a discipline right. to this. You, you don't want to, you know, uh, you look at life either through the lens of gratitude or you look at life through the lens of resentment. And this happens before the death of a child before you go blind, before suffering takes place, we have to make a fundamental choice. And there's that old you know, Jewish saying, right? I never knew a person who was grateful and unhappy. I've never known a person who was ungrateful and happy. Right. Why so? Because the person who lives a life of gratitude never takes anything for granted, including life. Mm -hmm. Everything is a blessing. Every day your life is a blessing. Uh, you know, and of course, the person who doesn't, who is mm -hmm. ungrateful, person who does take life for granted, does take blessings for granted, doesn't recognize them, is constantly comparing themselves over against others to see what they don't have. Mm -hmm. They're not blessed for what they do have. They're resenting for what they don't have. And so the, the, the key thing that we, the discipline for all Christians is that we're going to have to get ourselves into, you know, that discipline. And, and love is a discipline. And faith is a discipline. Make no mistake about it. That discipline of being able to trust God for the next 30 years, that I'm going to see my child and my child is going to be happy with him. That discipline of, of knowing I've, I've been blessed by this child for the last five years. And it was a blessing, you know, and now he's taken away from me, but I can't resent God because he didn't give another 30 years. I don't know what would have happened to my child right. if he'd lived another 30 years. What kind of trouble he might have gotten into? What kind of darkness may have awaited him? What kinds of difficulties or challenges might have, have been there? I, I just don't know, and I'm going to have to trust God and of course, what Jesus says is, is the key thing. I could just shift it from fear is useless, what is needed is trust. I would say resentment is useless, what is needed is trust. Okay. And that idea of resentment is so powerful wow. when suffering happens. I can see how it happens, but we're ju we just have to have a resilience in our faith, a resilience in our trust in God. I'm not going to let this turn into resentment of God, resentment of the people who didn't lose their child. I'm not going to let this turn into a set of negative emotions. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to use this to increase my faith. And, 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 and at the end of the day, I'm going to use it to increase my desire to serve the world. It's like those people, they lose their child and they suddenly start a foundation to help parents with similar situations, or they lose their child, uh, you know, uh, to a terrible disease. They start a foundation, foundation to try to, to help other parents so that they don't lose their that's children. That's right. right.
Yeah, not exactly so a way they, to they make take something that. positive. So in a lot of cases, it's how you channel it. Yeah. it. It's not why, it's what. What am I supposed to do with this? And also, sometimes, as yeah. we've said before, uh, the question isn't why me, it's why not me? What makes me particular special right. over anybody else, and why should somebody else suffer in, as opposed to me? And tying into that, here's another yeah. question that came into us via email that kind of relates mm -hmm. a little bit to it, and earlier what you were saying. Dear Father Spitzer, I understand suffering due to freedom, but what about natural disasters, like you were mentioning, like a tsunami or an earthquake? What about the suffering of the innocent? And of course, that's what I think you were talking about. Obviously, we think mm -hmm. of young children as being particularly innocent, but that's where people start to start to say, "Well, you know, I think sometimes we can understand people who seem to suffer when we think there's clearly they've done something wrong, but when it seems to yeah. be just something that happened, not only." Uh, you know, just on a happenstance for no cause that one can see, but to somebody who seems like they're trying to do all the right things. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, you know, I just remember talking with this father once, you know, and, and he, you know, he lost his son, and it was just a tragic accident. I mean, essentially, uh, uh, the, the son uh, wanted to see this golf course in Scotland that he was going to go, and he asked a person at night, you know, where's the golf course? And there was kind of a wall, and he scaled this wall, and he thought he was leaping over the wall into the golf course. Well, he wasn't. He leapt onto a whole set of rocks, you know, by accident down in the beach below. And, and of course, he was impaled on those rocks and died. And the father just looked up at me and he goes, I'm a righteous man. Why did this happen to me? And, and, and I don't want to be, you know, a flippant. I don't want to be superficial because I can't even begin to imagine this man's pain. But I do th think that Jesus, when he was talking about the camel going through the eye of a needle, in, in that circumstance, he wasn't just talking about rich people in the sense of having wealth. This term rich means much more than this. Rich means, you know, uh, having talents, having respectability, having, it could mean material wealth, uh, it could mean, you know, but Ignatius would say riches really means honors, glory, talent, skills, you know, all the things that, that make life good. And, and uh, you know, there's two logics. There's God's logic of love that gets us to heaven, and there's the logic of materialism. And the logic of materialism says this. It says, hey, no one deserves more materialistic suffering than somebody else. The person who has less materialistic suffering is a happier person than the one who has more materialistic suffering. That is to say, uh, when I mean materialistic suffering, I'm talking about like physical pain, mm -hmm. lack of talents, disabilities, uh, lack of opportunity, uh, growing up in a country where there isn't opportunity, lack of riches, right? This idea of what I'm going to call materialistic, um, you know, uh, suffering. Now, a lot of people think that that, that means you can't be happy. And what I would just say is, what Jesus is saying is, no, that's not the way it goes at all. No, no, happiness is not defined by how long your life is, how much, you know, materialistic happiness you have, not by how much opportunity you have. Happiness at the end of the day is going to be determined by how much you love people, how deep your faith is, and the eternal life toward which you are going to be destined. And that's a totally different view of happiness. Now, why the camel through the eye of the needle? What Jesus is trying to say is, you think that rich people are blessed. And by the way, this was a big shamazel in <laughs> Israel, right? I mean, this is like... As shamazels you know, go, dealing, right, yes, it was a big one. <laughs> yes, shamazels go, exactly. I mean, this is big because wealth was thought to be God's blessing. And not just material wealth, but if you had talents, God's blessing. You're a rabbi and you have that talent to be God's blessing. Oh, you don't have those talents. Oh, you don't have that respect. Ah, oh, you don't have that wealth. Go, oh, you have not been blessed. Jesus turns the whole thing on its 
head, which is why he uses that, that peculiar metaphor, right? And by the way, that metaphor is a typical hyperbolic metaphor that rabbis use, right? Of a camel going through the eye of a needle. Of course, that's impossible, you know, and so forth and so on. That's to get everybody's attention. And what's Jesus saying? He's trying to say, don't think so quickly that the rich have it made mm -hmm. and the poor don't. Don't think so quickly that those without physical suffering have it made, but those with their more than their fair share of suffering don't have it made. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. Frequently, it's the opposite opposite way, that those who have more than their fair share of pain have the deepest faith. Those who have more than their fair share of pain have the deepest mm -hmm. compassion for other people. Those who have more than their fair share of pain will make it into the kingdom of God much more easily than those who seem to have all the blessings. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to tell us in the analogy, this is all about suffering. It's not just about like wealth. It's about suffering. And, and he's trying to say, hey, don't say my life is cursed for the suffering. Uh, because I have suffering, because I have more than my fair share of whatever it is, physical pain, physical disability, lack of opportunity, lack of wealth, whatever it may be, you know, even a rotten, uh, you know, mom or a rotten father or whatever it may be, and that's tough to grow up with, right? All these things, don't say, you know, I got dealt a bad hand. You got dealt a good hand if you make it a good hand. If you start looking for how you can transform having what seems to be the bad hand, transform it right. into faith, transform it into trust in God, transform it in living for the higher things, transform it into living for humility and compassion and love and service, transform it into making a difference to the lives of people and the lives of the world because there are so many people, the greatest people we know, the most heroic figures, didn't have it all made in the shade. Right. Most of them, they, you know, it was a hard slog. I mean, look at Lincoln's life. Oh, my gosh. Or look at the lives of our saints. So many of them had just a well, rough, well, I rough I think that's start. also a reason why, you know, the lack of historical perspective, unfortunately, in m many of our schools today, I think, take away from no. people really understanding. Instead, they watch these these kind of glossy, uh, you know, airbrushed, uh, Photoshop view of the world that yep. they see on the, on the internet or on television as if somehow these people yeah. uh, really spend all their time looking like this as opposed to this being an illusion that's, that's put forward to people. All Let right. me ask you one quick question before we take a break. Sure. Now, one could be a, too attached to the goods of the world. That's how we kind of think about that. You brought up right. suffering with the, the eye of the needle. Can someone become too attached to one's sufferings? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in, in a way, um, you, you could probably be too attached if you were self-pitying. Mm -hmm. In that case, it would be very negative. In other words, it's me against the world, you know, or, you know, uh, it's that self-pitying, you know, where you say, I can take it, I can master it. Mm -hmm. And what winds up happening is in all of this, there is kind of this rejection of others' care, and I can handle this myself, you know. And when you go into self-pity, remember, you're going into a cycle called the eros of death, right? The more you pity yourself, the more you kind of take delight in these feelings of death that, you know, people call the eros of the love of death, the romantic love of death. Because, of course, the more the self-pity deepens, the more the eros of death deepens. And, of course, that's where people can actually right. bring themselves to suicide. That's horrible. Right. However, if you do it like St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Therese of Lisieux made a vocation of suffering. Mm -hmm. She said, this is the way God wants me to serve. He wants me to serve just like his son served on the cross. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to suffer. And uh, during this suffering, I'm going to take that self suffering. I'm going to take that suffering and give it to the Father. Give it to the Lord as self sacrifice. Translate self-sacrifice as agape mm -hmm. love.
self-sacrificial, compassionate love. I'm going to give you, Lord, this suffering as the gift. It's the only gift I have, but it's a great gift because there's deep pain involved. I'm going to give you this suffering of my tuberculosis at St. Therese of Lisieux. Now, take this pain. I'm trusting you totally. I'm trusting you completely. Take this pain as my gift to you, as my self-sacrificial gift to you, as my gift of love to you, and shower it upon whomever you think needs this gift. And by the way, I think this criminal over here could use a little of that gift. Give it to him. And of course, you know, we know that in a couple of particular mm -hmm. cases in her life, these guys actually converted practically at the guillotine, you know. Right, based on and some so, correspondence uh, or the she guillotine. had with those people. Right, exactly. Yeah. That we have. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, well, the, the main point I'm trying to make is she made a vocation of suffering, right. but that's a positive uh, way of, of, of getting into that. suffering okay. where Yes, whereas self-pity is exactly the opposite. It becomes the eros of death, which is a terrible way right. of, of dealing with Well, suffering. again, like most things, it and, becomes and focused on ourselves rather than on the other, and that's where we usually find ourselves running into that's, trouble. We're going to take a break, and of mm -hmm. course, we want to remind everybody that Father Spitzer's uh, book, God So Loved the World, is out and available now, uh, out from Ignatius Press, available through EWTNRC.com, Religious Catalog, Clues to Our Transcendent Destiny from the Revelation of Jesus. And look for a special show we're going to do right here on Father Spitzer's Universe at the end of uh, August on this particular book, God So Loved the World. Much more ahead here on Father Spitzer's Universe. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us right here in the midst of Father Spitzer's universe. One of the things we want to recommend from Father Spitzer is his book, Finding True Happiness, Satisfying Our Restless Hearts, uh, published by Ignatius, available through the EW10 Religious Catalog. Another fine book, which uh, covers many of the uh, topics we talk about on this particular program, uh, Father Spitzer's universe. Now, Father, uh, turning back to us talking mm -hmm. about uh, suffering and how people deal with suffering, you know, I was looking at an article online and they were talking about the idea, why are Catholics so into suffering? Isn't Jesus about healing? And this person wrote off that many evangelicals have a hard time understanding why Catholics put so much value in suffering. Some of these good Christians think that faithful Christians should always be physically healed if they pray hard enough. I mean, does it seem like we spend too much time talking about suffering? No, because honestly, there's plenty of suffering in life. And, and the idea that if you pray hard enough, you're going to be healed, that, that is a, an absolutely incorrect theology. Sometimes if you pray hard enough, you will be healed if it's God's will. But the one thing we have to remember is God has six priorities in the, in the healing of suffering. The first priority is not the healing of suffering. The first priority is to get you to heaven. That's the first thing. So God's not going to heal you if somehow that healing is going to interrupt your course to salvation. If the suffering is going to be good for your salvation, God's not going to heal you. Number two, others' salvation. So God's second priority is not to heal the suffering. God's priority first is to make sure that your life is going to touch all kinds of lives, right? And, and so, uh, you know, if some suffering in your life is going to lead you to help others toward their salvation, then God is going to make sure that, that suffering will continue. I, I honestly believe that, that, for example, my uh, blindness and my progressive mm -hmm. blindness is, is actually helping me to help others 
toward their salvation. And I think God, you know, is not going to interrupt this process. It's a, an extremely good process, extremely good way of, of, of using, you know, my gifts in this life. I don't think he's going to stop that because I think there, there are good things happening from it. There's a third thing that's going on too, and that concerns human freedom. God is not going to, to somehow blow up your freedom in order to alleviate suffering. So for all intents and purposes, you know, we, we get into that whole thing of why didn't God lobotomize Hitler? Mm -hmm. Look at how much suffering he caused. Why didn't he just strike him dead? Well, why didn't he strike Stalin dead? And why didn't he strike every tyrant dead? And now that we're thinking about it, why didn't he strike everyone dead who was about to do something that was devastatingly painful to somebody else? Oops, we're all struck dead. Mm -hmm. Where does God draw the line? And here's the point. Human freedom is an awesome gift of God. And we've been given this awesome gift of God, this human freedom, we have been given this, and God's not going to take it away. Mm -hmm. God's not going to lobotomize everyone who's going to do something wrong. God's not going to temporarily lobotomize you if you're about to do something wrong. God's going to leave us in a world where our freedom matters, because freedom is all about our self-definition, and ultimately our choice to move into the kingdom of God, which is the most important decision that we're going to be making. For all intents and purposes then, you can be sure that God is not going to wipe out people who may be causing suffering, and not going to wipe you out mm -hmm. if you're going to be causing uh, suffering uh, to somebody. For all intents and purposes, he's going to preserve freedom first. Number four, God is going to make sure that other people's freedom are preserved. Covered that already. Mm -hmm. Finally, now, we get to the point, if all the previous four conditions have been met, and of course, God, remember, is going to keep within the context of a modicum of natural causation. And you say, well, why would God want to preserve natural causation? Why does he just give everybody a miracle? Because if God gave every single person a miracle and there was no natural causation out there of any kind at all, right? You couldn't predict. Right? So, I mean, okay, I got sick, God help me, and uh, now I'm healed, right? So I'm sick for one second, right? The, the point, of course, is if God's doing that all the time, then there's no challenges that we have to face. And believe me, we need challenges that we have to face, otherwise we're going to be relegated to a little pleasure bubble. Mm -hmm. If you want to have your freedom, if you want the good use of your freedom, if you want to test your mettle, if you want to see who you really are, if you're really willing to make a self-sacrifice for something noble and something good and for the church and for the kingdom of God and for faith, if you're really willing to sacrifice, right, to, to, to make a difference in compassion to somebody else's life, if you really want to become humble, you're going to need some challenges. Mm -hmm. You can't get by without them. So God's not going to leave you in a pleasure bubble. God's going to challenge you so that you're going to say, courage or cowardice, what will I do? Right. Compassion or just let people suffer and stew and brew. I'm going to carry my own weight. You carry yours, right? Is it, you know, challenge or is, you, you get the, the, the point. Right, We've exactly. got these choices before us that come in the midst of challenges. I mean, it's the challenge to cor toward courage, the challenge toward compassion, the challenge toward faith, the challenge toward right. trust in God, the stuff that makes us deep instead of just superficial pleasure bubble little children, right? right? It's these challenges course, that are important. Of course, now, sometimes God's we feel like, uh, you know, we could use a few more pleasure bubbles here and there just to kind of spice things up. That, <laughs> well, you know, enough. some of us could have that happen once in a while. You know, one of the things I was thinking about while you were talking about yeah. was that famous book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People by Rabbi Harold right. S. Kushner. 
And, and you know, Kushner made yeah. the point, like you do, that people have to be free, and that's why, so they can do bad things as well as good things, otherwise we'd be automatons. Mm -hmm. But So he kind of came up with, you know, then understanding God, either God does not exist, God exists but is not good, he's not good, or God exists and is good but is not all powerful. And it seemed to be, I think, the one that he ended up with. How would we respond to that approach? Yeah, my dad had a little parable, you know, that he told. It was an adaptation, actually, of a of a rabbinical tale about heaven and hell. But he kind of switched it around to talk about suffering, and, and this is essentially uh, how he told it. He said, you know, once upon a time, God created the entire world as a banquet table, and, and on the banquet table, he, he placed all these people, but they didn't have any elbows and they didn't have any neck joints. And he placed a sumptuous feast in front of all of them. And clearly, they couldn't eat the feast. They could smell it. They were hungry. They were starving. But they couldn't feed, right? They, they couldn't feed themselves. They couldn't bring the, their arms up to their mouths. And so one group at, the, at, the, at one end of the table is, is saying, essentially, look, God can't be all powerful. Because if God were all powerful, he'd be omniscient. And if God were omniscient, like all knowing, right, he would know that it would be better to make people with elbow joints and, and neck joints than to not make them that way so that they could feed themselves. So clearly God isn't all powerful. A second group is sitting by and they go, no, 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 no. If God exists and God is all powerful, uh, you know, that, 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 that makes sense to me. It's just that he's not all loving. God's not all loving because, of course, uh, you know, if he were truly loving, then he would never have allowed us to suffer by p giving us no elbows or neck joints. You know, we're just sitting here in front of this feast and starving. There was a third group sitting next to them. And, oh no, if God exists, then God would have to be all powerful and all loving. Clearly, because he hasn't given us elbows and neck joints, he doesn't exist. Uh, they, of course, didn't ask the question, well, where did we come from and where did the feast come from or anything like that. But let's suppose they were good Nietzscheans who just didn't bother to ask that question. But then there was a fourth group that was sitting at the very end of the table. And, and they, they stopped asking all the questions. They stopped kind of theorizing, and they looked across the table, and they saw that without elbows, they could pick the food up in front of their neighbor who was sitting across from them mm. and feed them. And so at the very moment then of the challenge, looking beyond themselves, recognized that they could feed the other person and love freely was born. And of course, that makes all the difference. But it was born in the midst of the challenge. It was born when the challenged challenged us to move beyond ourselves. It was born in the moment when we were in a sacrificial moment and decided to give of ourselves rather than to resent what we were not given. And of course, said my father, that's why there's challenge and suffering. And that's how he would have answered Kushner, uh, you know, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, and, and that's how I would answer him. I, I think that's why God did it. He, he explicitly wanted us to look beyond ourselves, to discover self-gift, to create a community which was interdependent, to grow in, in, in depth of faith, in, in trusting him. He, he wanted us to feed the people right. across the table through the challenge. Well, we describe and define ourselves in terms of it right. and therefore choose his kingdom of heavenly love. Well, thank you so much, Father. That certainly was the intention of Mother Angelica and this network to feed those out there. And I think we're doing our small bit here. So we'll uh, catch you next time when we re-enter your universe next Wednesday night. And we'll see you Wednesday afternoon as well. Uh, encore airings, of course, are on Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, Sunday at 3 a.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. Pacific. And also, you can listen to us right on EW10's radio network, Saturdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. If that's easier, check out the Magis Center website at magiscenter.com. We have all these wonderful books at EW10RC.com to check out. And next time you join us, we'll be talking about the evidence of God's existence. Why do we have the impression that all scientists are atheists? Are they really? Your answer we have may surprise you. See you next time.